Major funding for this program is provided by a grant from HSH Nordbank. Additional funding is provided by grants from Signature Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, the Wickhoff Group, Bristol Assisted Living, and the Engel Berman Group. Forty-nine years ago, a young man is born in French Hospital in the Bronx. Lives on Gun Hill Road, Riverdale, graduates high school, goes to Union College, Hofstra, Hofstra University graduates, and then completes law school. This young man today is the owner of many of the city's major properties, the Woolworth Building, the Daily News Building, 485 Lexington Avenue. This man is my guest, and I'm very happy to, to bring Steve Whitkoff, the chairman and CEO of the Whitkoff organization, with me today. Thank you, Michael. So, Stephen, you know, you said you were born in the Bronx, and you told me when we got together that your father was a, a major influence on your life. Tell me a little bit about your dad and his influence on your life. You know, I say all the time that my father was just a good man. He really was. He was a really good man, almost impeccable ethics and integrity. Uh, and he was in business for himself. So I always wanted to be in business for myself. Now, at 25 years of age, you graduate law school and you get a job with this prominent uh, law firm where Donald Trump were his clients, all the major clients. You get a job in the litigation department at Dreyer and Trout. Yes. And what were you doing over there? You were a litigator? I was a litigator doing real estate law. Dreyer and Traub was a boutique real estate firm, and so the litigation department was ancillary to all the real estate uh, um, departments that they were running. And then a year and a half later, you, you said, hey, I don't want to be in litigation. I want to learn about those deals. I want to own, which you own a lot of the properties in Lower Manhattan, you want to own uh, you want to become a little bit of an operation, and you, you now go into the regular real estate department. Yes. And who were you working on? What clients were you working on at that time? You remember? I was working with Jerry Schrager, who um, is, you know, was and is legendary. I mean, it was a fantastic opportunity, and I was doing a lot of work for Donald, um, who was really a great client to work for. He's, he became my friend as a result, you know, as a result of uh, those experiences back then. Uh, integrated Resources, uh, Peter Calico, who was a fantastic client to work for. He was also one of the best. Um, and just a lot of, uh, you know, very, very interesting entrepreneurs. Eddie Penson, I remember. So, so now you're 27 or 28 years of age, and at that time you said, I'm going to leave, you know, Dryer and Traub, and you were going to go into, you went to another law firm. Where'd you go? I went to Rosenman, Rosenman and Colin. And what were you doing over there? I was doing real estate law for about perhaps nine months, and then I left shortly uh, after about nine months. So here you are, you're 29 years of age, um, you're engaged, I think, right? You, you, I had a, I, yes, I had a, uh, a fiance who was to become my wife. Who worked for Dreyer and Traub. Who worked for George Ross, who, as you well know, is on the, is, is, you know, is now Donald's in-house counsel. George is a fan, you know, was a terrific guy. And uh, Lauren, my wife, worked for George um, in the commercial leasing department. And I, I, you know, I, I felt a drop, it was a drop strange about having a girlfriend slash fiance at the firm, so it made it um, an easier decision for me to go to Rosamond. But I always knew that it wasn't going to be a long-term now, stay. Now, it's, you're 28 or 29 at that time, and you had a, a senior, a, a person who was a couple of years older who was a partner at this time yes. at Dreyer and Traub. Uh, Larry Gluck. Yes. And the two, while you're, you're working at Roseman, he's working at Dreyer and Traub, you decide to buy two buildings. Tell well, me about well, those two buildings. Well, and what well Larry and I met it at Dreyer and Traub, and Larry owned, if I, wanna, if I recall correctly, one or two small three or four unit buildings in Brooklyn. And so um, I think we fed on each other. Um, 
And the first building that you bought was, was that Sherman Avenue? 164 Sherman Avenue. And what kind of building was that? 32 unit walk up, five story walk up. And the other building which you bought? Quickly followed by 915 Post at the corner of Dykeman Street. Now, now this was a change in your life. You bought this building at 915 Post in Inwood, when Inwood was an area in transition because you've been in Washington Heights, you've been otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, and you bought the building and then you told me that you had the opportunity to either keep it or you, as we would say in the proverbial business, you flipped it. Yes, we resold them. So in pretty quick order, we made, um, you know, in what we in in those days, what seemed like a, a fortune of money to us. I mean, it, it really wasn't, but I mean, it was it, it it but it was more than enough to give us our grub stake and to allow us to leave the uh, law practice and start a small real estate business. So now we have this guy Steve Whitkoff and Larry Gluck, and you go to your father who was in the coat business, who graduated, high, uh, graduated City University at 19 years of age, who really could have gone to Harvard, but he went into the family business because his father had passed on, I think. He, he right. was supposed to go to Harvard, medical right, school. Right, Harvard Medical School. And now you say to him, you went to your mother, you went to your dad, and you went to Lauren, and you said, Larry and I are gonna go out and we're gonna go into business. Correct. You told me something interesting about your dad, because you know he, everybody has an opinion. What, well, I, because I had, early on, I had a difficult relationship with my father. You know, in the early years, we became best of friends after, you know, later on, but best of friends. And he's passed on now, but best of friends. Um, but uh, early on, um, I expected my father to say to, to, to not be amenable or, um, or not, you know, not to uh, be supportive of this. My mother, um, who was always supportive, you know, I grew up in a family where my mother told me I was the smartest, the brightest. I wasn't, but of course that was my mother. That's, you know, they broke the mold with her. So my wife was a little bit reluctant. No one really th thought that, 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 uh, that we were gonna be successful. My, my mom was hesitant and my dad turned to me and I think in large part because of his experience where he was forced to go into his father's business to take care of his family and said to me, that's your dream, go for it. Right. And, that, and that was it for me. And then you, because your name was Stephen and because his name was Larry, you and Larry Gluck go out and create Stellar Management, right. and you go into a one-room office at Pines. It was Pines Eleven, Street? Eleven Park Place. Eleven Park Place, and you hired Sarah, mm -hmm. who who was your secretary. Right, she and was my secretary was, at Dreyer and Traub. She was at Dreyer and Traub. She was with you at Stellar, and when I w met with you last week, she's still in the office. Right. So people stay with you for a long time. Now, what happens next? What was the next transaction? Because now you had these, you were, you and Larry were, let's say, pioneers to go into Harlem. What were you doing over there? You were doing deals. Uh, we built a large portfolio in, in the Bronx and Washington Heights. Um, I, I think we had a very, very good reputation in, in those neighborhoods. We, we ran our properties responsibly. We got along with, um, uh, we never had, we, you know, we didn't have rent strikes at our at our properties. We got along with all the community groups and we were, um, I, I think that Larry and I were fairly well acknowledged, whether by HPD officials or community fi official uh, or community uh, representatives, as good, decent people. But those were tough times to operate up in the Heights in those days. And the interesting comment that you had said to me, you you were always north of 96th Street, and you didn't have the money to go south of 96th Street. We got Street. lucky, and you got lucky. Yes. And let's talk about the first acquisition when you went south of 96th Street. As opposed to going to Midtown, you went down, this is in the mid-90s when the world is really collapsing. Lower Manhattan was really in a, as we would say, the crapper at that time. Mm -hmm. And you and Larry go out and purchase a building at 156 William Street? We bought 156 William from, um, um, from the Bank of Nova Scotia. And tell uh, my audience, wh this was a 250,000 square foot building. What did you pay for it? It was a 250,000 square foot building, which I believe recently resold, I want to say for 45 million, I believe. Uh, no, I think it recently sold for 56 million to okay, be Okay, well, exact. 56, so there you go. And so we, we, we actually sold it the first time around for about 24, but we paid four and a half million so for it. So you paid four and a half million dollars in 1994 Five. 1995, which was approximately $16 a square foot yes. to own the land, to own the building in 156 William Street. Now, the interesting thing that you had mentioned to me was you, you realized that 
owning the building was important, but it was also perhaps managing the building efficiently that helped you make more money on the property. Well, that's where we, that's, that's how we, we came up with our game plan. We bought the building because it was across the street from our office. We had moved to 135 William Street. We were paying, which is across the street from 156. This building came on the market, and we bought it with um, another group, and they wanted to take office space there, and we wanted to take office space there, and that was the, that was the game plan, and we were going to operate it because Larry and I were, were, were operators. And we came in, Michael, there was no leasing market to speak of in those days. So, but we came in, and we soon realized that the building was heavily overexpensed. It had been owned by a bank, by an institution. It was institutionally run in those days. And the cleaning expenses were very, very high, and the electric was very, very high, and people were just not paying attention to the expense line items. And we were able to cut expenses by an enormous amount. We had an immediate cash flow. And so that became our game plan, go out and buy institutionally managed buildings and cut expenses. Now, to, to, to show how hands-on you were, you, had, you, you told me about, I, I still remember that snowstorm, the snowstorm that you, uh, you really became hands-on at 156 William Street. I, I think my audience would love to hear this that story. Was the, that was the snowstorm, I want to say, of 1996 in November. We had that horrible snowstorm that shut the city down, and 32BJ um, was out on strike. So me and a gentleman from my office, Frank Piccarillo, went down there with snow plows, and we were, sn we, were, we were removing snow all night. And the Resnick family owned the building across the street, and everybody would, was hiring non-union crews to, to plow snow. And these guys came over to smoke a cigarette with us, and they were t talking about how wonderful it was that 32BJ was out on strike, and that they were able to work thinking that, you know, we were a fellow team like them out there dick shoveling snow. And, uh, you know, I was the owner, and Frank had worked for me for 15 years, and we were too embarrassed to talk about, you know, the fact that we were the owner. Um, but uh, we were there all night shoveling snow. I mean, that's the way we ran our business. Later on, you then buy 10 Hanover, right? Yes. Let's talk about 10 Hanover. I mean, we, a lot of the properties down here you've owned, you've operated. But 10 Hanover, let's talk about that. What was 10 Hanover? That Kidder Peabody had formerly been in the building. It was owned by Leona Helmsley. Uh, property is approximately 530,000 square feet. And I believe we paid 12 and a half million for that property. Which Va comes out to? Va vacant, though. So, you, so here you are, you buy this vacant building, no tenants, in a difficult time for the real estate community. And what were your plans? What were you going to do with that building? We were, we were going to build a, a residential uh, uh, rental apartment building there. So you're going to convert the building. Yes. And what happened later on? We had a loan on the property, Hypo Bank, Peter Hannigan, who we were just beginning to uh, have a relationship with. And we had actually framed out five apartments to see how they, how, how, you know, how they framed out, had done all the work. And uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, got, was was look w which was Goldman Sachs was rumored to be doing a leasing deal at 55 Water, Standard and Poor's ended up doing that leasing deal and more took all the space. Goldman Sachs was now out of uh, uh, options at 55, and David Hamamoto, uh, John Mechanic actually called me up on the phone and said to me, Steve, David Hamamoto has called me up on the phone, knows you own this building. Would you be interested in meeting with him and talking to Goldman Sachs? We ended up going to Rayos together, all of us. And we literally, uh, spiritually, cut the deal at 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 at, at Rayos that evening, and then uh, it you know it it uh, took on a life of its own. Now you kept that building, so Goldman moves into the building. And last year, what did you do with Ten Hanover? Goldman moved. Goldman gave us notice. Uh, I want to say 18 months ago that they were terminating, and we have since uh, uh, gone back to our original plans, and it is now a 500-unit apartment building. And I think it's one of the uh, most special uh, residential rental apartment buildings downtown. And we're very, very focused on rentals. So we were, we were, very, we were thrilled to keep it a rental as opposed to a, as opposed to a condo. Now, you, you, were, you were like a guy who wanted to buy Lower Manhattan. You bought other buildings you bought. Uh, so you had 10 Hanover. You then bought one Broadway. One Broadway. Then you had Exchange Place. We had 20 Exchange Place, yes. Another building on Maiden Lane? 80, 90 Maiden, 33 Maiden, and 95 Maiden. And then it's like 1998 or 1999, you have the opportunity to buy the classiest landmark building in Lower Manhattan. 
all of a sudden, the kid from the Bronx buys the Woolworth building, which I bought with Ruby Schroen. Yes. So you buy the Woolworth building, and what, what, what are your thoughts? What are you going to do with the Woolworth building? Well, we thought it was a great, you know, it was a good, it was a great buy at the time, and candidly, it was a good buy at the time. I mean, it was, a, it was, it's an iconic building. It's a fantastic building. The Woolworth Corporation had put a fortune of money into it, and it was in fantastic shape, really fantastic shape. And we, we, we loved the property, and and uh, and, and and things were were great when we signed it up. And then, of course, four months later, the CMBS market cracked. This was in August of 1998, and you had that Russian bond collapse, and. Every lender we were talking to all of a sudden mysteriously disappeared. And that's sort of, you know, so that was the beginning of the, the, the cycle on the Woolworth building. Now, you know, I, I think what's interesting, I think very interesting for, for my audience, is that since you're an owner-operator and you own the Woolworth building, and, you know, this is September, we're in a time of, uh, you know, 9-11. What happened on 9-11? Where was Steve Whitkoff? On 9-11, um, my dear friend Bo Deedle, well, at the beginning of 9-11, actually, I watched the buildings come down from my office, and I, and I physically watched them come down. I mean, you, my, my, from the Daily News building, which is where my office is, you could actually see both buildings come down. So I watched the buildings come down. Um, then I got a frantic call from my wife that my kids were stranded up in Riverdale because they were at school at Riverdale Country Day School. So I took my car up to Riverdale, I don't think we discussed this part of the story, Michael, and you couldn't get back into Manhattan. So I left my car, because I, of course I knew the whole area, I left my car on 239th Street, sort of near Kingsbridge Road, at a gas station, a gentleman kept it, and me and my kids walked over the Dykeman Street Bridge into Inwood, where I of course knew every single restaurant. We stopped at a bar, I knew the proprietor, had a Cuban sandwich, and my kids had a Coke. Right, and then you went downtown, and you were part of the... You, and, then, you, and then we made it from Dykeman Street down to, down to uh, my apartment. And then my dear friend Bo Deedle and his um, then partner, Mike Cirovolo, who are two ex-NYPD uh, uh, detectives, Mike was a lieutenant, Bo was a detective, called me on the phone and said to me, Steve, I think we got to go down there and do whatever we can do, and, you know, do you want to come along? And I said, do I want to come along? Of course, it's a privilege. And so the three of us drove down there, and we got down, I want to say around, I guess around 6 o'clock at night or so. Um, and we stayed till, you know, the early morning hours. And we were on a rope. And like everybody else down there, we were hopeful that we would find somebody. I mean, because that's what everybody was down there for. Um, and, you know, we weren't professionals, so we were just listening to and helping out wherever we could. And, you know, we were connected to a, to, there was a fireman it was an amazing uh, event, Michael, that we were on a rope with a fireman who, um, you know, the guy must have been 55 years old, and we were holding him, and he was going down in 75, 100 feet down into these, mm. you know, toxic pits because uh, the flesh-sniffing dogs were getting hits. Mm. Hits. I mean, it was, that, was, that was the evening we had. Now, after 9-11, uh, um, you were able to, uh, even though we're in the City University, you, you made a deal and you converted a portion of the building to uh, the New York University School of Continuing Education. Yes, NYU came into the property, uh, as did the SEC. The SEC became a tenant of ours shortly thereafter. They were, obviously, they lost their space as well down there. Um, and, uh, and, and we were able to lease the Woolworth building up. And now, the to is the top still leased? Because at one no. time I heard that you wanted to make, and it would be spectacular condominiums yes. up there. We, we, we have taken and been approved for, Ruby and I have taken and been approved for, uh, we've taken the building through the landmark process, um, and we um, unanimously were, were uh, granted the ability to convert the property to the upper portion of the property, from floor 28 to 59, to a, um, a, a residential building. Um, the issue is rental or condominium, but today, you know, it's funny, you know, the, 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 the ups and downs of the New York City office market. Today, the office market is so strong that we are... might pay to keep it as office. Yes, and interestingly enough, we're right in the middle of, uh, of, of, um, of negotiating uh, uh, loans to, um, to convert it, and we have brokers calling us up on the phone telling us that the office market is fantastic. Maybe we, we want to give that some consideration. So it's something we're thinking about. But now, now, that's, that's a, that's a high-class problem Then to you have. decide to, to leave downtown, you know, in, in this period of time, and um, you, uh, you buy a, a very, another landmark building. You buy the Daily News building. Yes. 
And what, what are the properties that have you bought and owned in Midtown? We uh, bought and owned um, 370 Lexington Avenue, which we bought, renovated, and, uh, and sold. Um, 866 Third Avenue. Now that's an interesting story. That was a vacant building. Yes, the McMillan building. The McMillan building. And what you did there was really a, a very unique structure. We, we uh, condominium the building and we, we, we formulated three separate condominiums. The downstairs retail, which we currently still own. The middle section of the building, which was ultimately sold to Sloan Kettering as their uh, Midtown main uh, headquarters office. And then the top of the building, which was uh, c converted by us into a married courtyard hotel, which we uh, do not own anymore, and the married corporation has bought that back from us. Now, you and your partner, Matt Adele, another partner and another yes. buddy, I mean, it's like the Rayo Club over here, uh, yes, sir. with Bo, uh, were like the flower market was on 6th Avenue, and Matt's father and he were very instrumental in the converting it. And yes. You, 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 you built the first market rate rental right over there the capital yeah you know um, uh, this was again 1998 when the market when people were pretty nervous pretty roundly nervous about the market the CMBS the commercial mortgage backed securities market had come down and uh, this was in August of uh, 1998 and I was at my uh, club and Matt was there and Matt had done in fairness all of the rezoning work um, or had led the charge for the rezoning work in the uh, flower market district and he was he was looking for partners, and over a hot dog, we, Matt and I made a, a business deal. And we bought he had three sites there, and we bought all three sites, and we uh, together uh, built and developed uh, the Capital at Chelsea, which was which is a 500,000 square foot market rate rental property, and we TCO'd that, um, got a temporary certificate of occupancy in, uh, in in 13 months, which was you know almost unheard of. And that building you sold. And then we ultimately sold it to the J.P. Morgan Fleming Fund, which is one of the largest core uh, uh, funds out there. And then a couple years ago, there was the Teachers Insurance property, 485. Uh... Yes, we, we bought uh, 485 um, uh, Lexington and 753rd with S.L. Green. And the City Investment and Fund. And the City Investment Fund, yes. And that building... Um... That had about a million square feet vacant. SL Green is leading the leasing charge on that, and you know, you know what I think of them. I think they're exceptional, Mark Holliday and Andrew Mathias, and uh, they've leased, uh, they, they, they've, for all intents and purposes, leased that entire building at well beyond what we, what we thought we were going to get. And, and then you went over the water. You, you were in Fort Lee with Fort Lee Plaza. Yes. You were in Newark with uh, Prudential Office yes. Building. You were up in Westchester. Yes. And, and then there's an interesting project that I'd like to discuss. Uh, you and Giuseppe Cipriani mm -hmm. um, took over 55 Wall, which was the Region Hotel. Yes. Tell, us, tell me a little bit about 55 Wall. Well, you know, I knew Giuseppe for a number of years, um, and he came to me, called me up one day, and he said to me, I'd like to talk to you about a real estate deal. He had originally bought 55 Wall Street way back when uh, with um, Sidney Kimmel. And First Boston had done the financing. We, of course, owned uh, 20 Exchange Place at the time. And I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the buildings are attached underneath the street. Hmm. So way back when, there was some discussion about doing something jointly, and it we never never came to be. Um, Giuseppe uh, was running the ballroom. Sydney had converted 55 into the Region Hotel, which was a fantastic hotel. Right, but the market had changed, 9-11, so he decided to right. close the hotel. He decided to close the hotel. And he went to Giuseppe and said to Giuseppe, I want to give you the opportunity to buy it first. I really don't want to put it on the market. And I know you're, this is something that's important to you. And maybe you want to op operate the ballroom here again. And Giuseppe was looking for a real estate partner. So now, uh, which is a very classy building, you and Giuseppe have, are converting the hotel portion into condominiums. But as opposed to regular condominiums, you put uh, they furnished. Condominiums. Correct. Well, first of all, there's there's two there's two pieces to the building. There is the ballroom piece. We 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 created two condominiums. The ballroom, which is wholly owned by the Cipriani organization, that's his business. It's not mine, and I'm not. That's that's not a business that I would bring any value to. So that's that's his. And then we became partners in the conversion of the um, hotel back into condominiums, and we then decided to fully furnish them and make it a one-stop shopping sort of experience for, for buyers there. And I think it's been pretty well received.
yeah. Sal and McCowan, who, which, which is a fantastic interior uh, designer. Uh, this is Calvin Sal did the uh, did the furnishings, and they all came out of Europe, and and it's you know it's it's pretty wonderful because you come in and you don't have, really have to. You know, there's not a lot of heavy lifting. Right, and now you have another site that you're planning to develop rental housing on 8th Avenue? Yeah, because we pr we're primarily rental housing people. That's what we do. Um, where is that site? That's on 44th and 8th, and I think we're going to do an 80-20 there. We're certainly not doing a condo. So you're going to um, do a rental on that. And then you have the uh, another site on York Avenue? We have a site on 61st and York, which we own with Lehman Brothers, that um, we're in discussions right now as to exactly what we're going to do with that, rental or, or condo. I, I think I personally prefer rental, I really do, um, but, uh, but, but that's, that's a discussion point. And you have the land uh, under the Best Western on 48th Street also? We, have, we bought the land under the Best Western on 48th Street, and then we bought that fantastic Mitchell Lama project up on uh, 95th and Columbus, which we've committed to keeping as a rental for quite, you know, for you know, certainly as long as we own it. I mean, we, we believe in rental. We really do. We think so, it's, our, it's, it's, it's the right thing for New York City, and so. So Steve Whitkoff uh, has really shaped the, the changes of New York. What, what do you see, uh, what's next for Steve Whitkoff? Where, where are you going to build? Are we going to go to Harlem? Are we going to go to Long Island City? Do you want to stay in Manhattan? You know, I think Manhattan is, is inimitable. It's, it's an incredible place, and we love it. And we've, been out, we've operated outside of Manhattan, Michael. I mean, we've operated in San Francisco, in Hawaii. We did, we did some large things in, in, in London. And, and we don't foreclose those opportunities. You know, one of the things that happened for me is that when I was up in Washington Heights with Larry, and me and Larry, I remember this vividly, Larry and I used to think to ourselves that, that, that 96th Street was like the Maginot Line. We were never going to be able to cross it. And then one day we realized that we could. And so we've had the great, great fortune, and I, I certainly have had the great fortune, of, of now you know, having a lot of dreams realized. And so I think anything's possible out there. That's not to say that, that, that it's not a tough market out there, an environment. But. So, you know, it's interesting from the, the kid who grew up in the Bronx, who was born in the Bronx, French hospital, who has be practiced become a lawyer, who's become other things, who's truly a builder of New York, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity of having you today. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You. Thank you. Major funding for this program is provided by a grant from HSH Nordbank. Additional funding is provided by grants from Signature Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, the Wickhoff Group, Bristol Assisted Living, and the Engel Berman Group.